There we go. Good morning. Why don't we stand together as we worship King, and we give him praise because he's worthy and, um, and because we love him. So uh, we're just going to pray into this morning, and then we'll just we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that your presence is already here. May you speak to us this morning. And we love you in Jesus' name. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, every war he wages, he will win. Cause I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how the story is. Yes, I know. Yes, I know how the story is. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see you. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. 
I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for our victory. Lord, we thank you for our victory, that you've already won the battle for us. And that you are for us, Lord. That you've chosen us, that you see us, that you desire us.
You have never failed us. You won't forsake us. Cause you were the word at the beginning. The one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory. There's no more distance between earth and heaven because Jesus paid the price for us so that we can live freely in him. Come on, we're going to sing, Death Could Not Hold You. Because death could not hold you. Come on, church. The veil tore before you. You silenced the most of sin and grave. The heavens You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Cause you have no rival, you have no
Hello, I'm Linda Hudson, and on behalf of Pastor Ken and our church family, we want to welcome you to Carmel Mountain Christian Church's online service. Thank you for joining us today. Please like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If this is your first time with us, we're so happy you've joined us. We'd love to connect with you. Please text CMC to 833-535. 0980 and someone will reach out to you. For fellowship word and prayer throughout the week, please check out the slides on the screen for our weekly events. Women's ministry on Monday, Facebook Live on Wednesday, prayer on Thursday and on Friday are adult ministry enough. For more information, check in at info at carmelmountainchurch.com. Now for some new things on the horizon, the constant underlying threat of COVID is not going to keep us from moving forward. Our CMC Wednesday night Bible study is returning on October 6th. Mark your calendars and stay tuned for more details. Also, stand by for more information regarding the discipleship class that's coming in October. And if you're able to join us on Sunday mornings, by popular demand, the CMC First Sunday Potluck is returning on Sunday, October 3rd, following the service. Break out those family recipes and let the feast begin. And in the quest to bring people to Christ, we have what we call Invite and Rewrite. Invite someone to church on Sunday and help us rewrite a chapter, a new chapter, at Carmel Mountain Christian Church. Let's follow Jesus' proclamation in Matthew 16, 18, where he says, Upon this rock, I will build my church. So let's invite and rewrite. And now, as we move into our offering time, we want to give you the opportunity of a lifetime. Have you been blessed in your time with Carmel Mountain Christian Church? Whether you participate Sunday mornings in person or tune into our various online live venues, we'd love to invite you to a deeper experience. Please prayerfully consider starting or increasing your financial support with Carmel Mountain Christian Church. Although church is not often looked at as a business, it still costs a sizable amount of money to maintain our physical presence to pay our wonderful ministry leaders and to provide the high quality online engagement opportunities that we have. Due to the challenges during the COVID pandemic, it has led to the accrual of unforeseen financial debt, making the need even greater. While it may seem impossible for some of you to give away a tenth of your income or the tithe, remember what you're buying into. The most important work in people's lives, their eternal salvation and joy. Some of you may not have an understanding of how much to give. To make it real and practical, every member, if every member gave $250 each month, we would be able to maintain a continue ministry in our current formats. If you know that your tithe is above this figure, then your faithfulness and obedience to the Word of God is needed. If you think that you're going to suffer on account of giving, remember the Lord's challenge and promise to us in Malachi 3, verse 10. He says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. 
I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Won't you consider tithing to Carmel Mountain Christian Church and see what God will do in the church and in your lives as well? For ways to give, you can text GIVE to 833-535-0980 or give online at carmelmountainchurch.com. Let us pray. Lord, we know that you constantly bless us with more than we could ever ask or imagine. And now we pray that our hearts will be touched and will be obedient to your challenge to test you and see. And how through our obedience, you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings in return. May we be good stewards of all that is given. We're standing on your promises, Lord, your promises that never fail. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, we sing You Give Life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour
to the Lord today. God in heaven. Lord, your kindness and your goodness really just goes beyond anything that we can think or measure. Because you could just sit there, God, on your throne and just rule, Lord, but you, because you love us so much, decided you would send your son down here and reach into the very bowels of earth and into humankind and redeem us back unto yourself. And so because of what Jesus did, now we have access to you, God, and to the tree of life. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Because part of your greatness, Heavenly Father, is wrapped in your love and the way that you feel for us. So, Lord, it's been a week since some of us have gotten together and just shouted praises to you. It's been a few days, Heavenly Father, since we had corporate prayer, God, but we pray now in the name of Jesus and saying thank you, Lord, for this body of believers that are listening to me live right now and those who are watching and listening online. I pray, God, that in the name of Jesus, you will reach right down into each one of us, God, reach down into our situations, Heavenly Father, God, and act and move move as only you can as only you know how God you see because you're personal God you're about relationship and so because you have relationship with us you know our inner thoughts God you know what's going on deep inside of us those things that we don't want to talk about God you know them and you want to deal with them so today God we give all of that to you We praise you and we honor you and we bless you today. So this isn't about really asking you for anything, really, God, but it's about adoration. It's about praise. It's about honor. Because we have to come to a point where we begin to understand our breakthrough sometimes is in our praise. And if we don't want to praise you, we don't get a breakthrough. But we praise you today, God, and we ask you and invite you in for our breakthrough we love you Lord and we praise you and we honor you we give you this day in all that we say and all that we do for all of that is in the powerful most mighty name in the heavens and in the earth is in the name of Jesus that we pray amen amen say amen over there where you are all right you all may be seated thank you I had that little background music thing going there. That was good. Even uh, Porter, when he was up here, had a little background music with you, going with you. How'd you like that? Was that all right? I wanted to sing. You wanted to sing, but thank God for little mercies that he didn't. <laughs> so he didn't start singing. Then anyway, we have a whole new scenario then. God bless you all, and welcome to those of you who are here at church today and those of you who are Uh, watching and listening online. God bless every single one of you. I have a special message I want to give you right now before I get into my main message, and we'll see if I get to that or if I don't get to that. I'm not really sure. Because I do want to talk to you something about a serious matter. So this is me having a family talk with you. Um, Because we've got something that's going on here at Carmel Mountain Christian Church, and me as the lead pastor, I need to try to keep you guys informed of what's happening. 
So uh, this is really a talk with you about COVID and the impact that COVID has had on CMC. Now everyone knows that every church, no matter where the church is located, was impacted by COVID in one way or another. And we preach, all preachers are preaching. We're preaching B, uh, before COVID, COVID begins with a C, doesn't it? B.C. and after COVID. And we're still in the aftermath of COVID. So before COVID, we were all going as our churches and doing our own thing and just going along. And really, COVID shook the foundations of what we would call our churches, I don't want to use the word, word religion because it's really not about that. It's about relationship with God. But it shook our church and every church in what we thought we should be doing and how we thought we should be doing it. Now that is universal. And that has had an impact on us here at, Col at Carmel Mountain Christian as well. And I'm going to tell you about that today. And I'm not telling it to you to discourage you, but I'm telling it to you because for action, right? You should be asking yourself before I say anything, why does this matter? And why does this matter to me? I'm talking to everyone here and I'm talking to you online. Because what has happened is what I'm standing in front of today. And what we have is we have some sort of rotation that I don't understand. I don't think any church really actually understands the rotation that's happening. So in other words, we have X number of people in the building right now who are here listening to me, looking at me right now. Next week, there will be a rotation and it will be another set of people who are in here and sitting here and listening to me. And it doesn't seem like that we're all here and gathering together because the building would be packed out. It would be packed out if everyone who showed up the last two weeks were in here today, we would be packed out. But there seems to be some sort of rotation that's going on among the people of God. And again, I'm speaking about our church specifically, but I'm really speaking about all churches because that's what pastors are talking about. Are you all with me? Yes. So I could commission someone to do some research and all of that and try to figure out what's going on with that. Why are people acting that way? What do we need to do? Blah, 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 blah. But to me, it's just the confusion that's covering the earth. It's the spirit that's covering the earth because of the COVID virus and all that stuff from last year and to the present because it's still here. And so it's causing a shakeup within the church. So the impact that it's had here on us at Carmel Mountain Christian has been huge. In the last year and a half, we've lost over 65% of our staff and our workers. That's a major impact on us. And that has happened without people coming back in and replacing them. COVID had this effect. You guys know this. We were just out having a good time yesterday. We went to the, the uh, outlet mall up there in Alpine. You guys ever been there? or any outlet mall. And as we're walking through there, it was almost like it was some sort of ghost town. It's just stores among stores, close, 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 close. That place used to be a zoo. If we walk around this mall that I'm standing in here, this strip mall, you'll see businesses have closed. And why? Because of COVID and the restrictions we had of COVID. So where I'm going with this is with this building that we have here, we still had to pay rent, or we were still supposed to pay rent when the building was empty and no one was in it. When we finally started to start back up, and we were meeting outside and, you know, trying to, you guys remember that, trying to make some adjustments, we still had to pay for this building. And so what is happening is we accrued debt that we never had before, as a result, because I think our manager was really more than a gentleman and treated us great over that. That's my opinion. But he's a person, too, who has some bills to pay, and he's saying, like, what are you guys doing? We need our payment here, and we need to pay. And he's been great. He's been great. But we have a deadline to come back from all of those months, 18 months now, I want you guys to think about that. You know when COVID started. 
and not paying rent and all of that accruing, now we've got that and we've got to come back with that. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying in the most serious manner that I could possibly say it. If you want this church to remain here, do you, 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 those of you who are online, do you believe that God is doing something here in this church and doing something with this ministry? And if you believe that that is true, then you need to take action. This is not time to pass the buck and say if somebody else will do it, but pass the buck to the church. That's what it is time for. It is time for us to put into action the theology that we already know about tithes and offerings. And consistently be tithers to what it is that God has done. If we don't do that, then... I'm not even going to speak certain words because, you know, there's power in the tongue. So I'm not going to speak certain words. I'm just telling you in a business sense that well, that has been what has happened. And we need action from the people of God who call this place church. This is what has happened because I talked about that rotation and that rotating coming in and out. So I know that there's a lot of people online who watch this service because actually... If we look over the stretch, the period of time since COVID hit, our online ministries have shot up. What Porter was talking about with the Wednesday ministry, we got our own ministry thing that's going on with people who are just all over the world. We've got stuff going on with people on Mondays and who are coming in. I have no idea, as I testified last week, who was watching the Sunday morning services, but we see the numbers. So what am I saying? I'm saying if all those people on those platforms were sitting in here now, we'd probably have to go to two services. But here's the disconnect, those of you who are sitting at home and sitting online. The disconnect is that the money is not coming in. You're not tithing. You're not paying the offering. You're not doing what's necessary to support the church. So we have to make some real decisions coming up here in the future. Our board, you're going to be hearing from them in a couple of, uh, for the next few weeks. We have two board members who are here today, Carla and Tom, that are there, and the other board members are David and Rail. And you're going to be hearing from them in a different way what it is that I'm saying to you. But listen, the bottom line is it's time for action. It's time for action. So we crunch the numbers, and these, this is real fast. We crunch the numbers, and we know that if people paid their tithes, if every person paid their tithes, all it would be is $250 a month from every person who calls Carmel Mountain Christian Church their home. Now, some of you, that number doesn't work because you would make way more money than that. And you would be in sin, if I might say that. You might be in sin because you know that your tithe is more than that. Now, God has been telling me something, and I've been fighting him and kicking back. This has been a tough week for me and for my wife and family because of some of this stuff. And I've been kicking and fighting God. And like, I don't want to get up there and say that, but I'm going to say it. Because he said, there are people who are listening to me now and in this congregation who make six figures and should be putting $10,000 plus into the offering, and they're really more approaching 1000 instead of 10,000. I don't know who that's for. But God is saying, I'm talking to you. And we have seen that in the past, to be honest with you. This is a critical stage that we're at, and we've never really been like this. But we've had people who've heard me give a message similar to this and just write a check for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, whatever. And if that's you, then will you take to the pen and the paper or get on and do what it is that God is telling you to do? And those of you who are online and watching this, will you do what God is telling you to do? I'm going to pray about that. Lord, that was a real hard message that I had to give him. But you know what, God? We have to sit down with family. You sit down with us as your family, and I'm sitting down with these people as family and telling them what's going on in our house our house and our house happened to be your house your house and your ministry 
And even though we talk about it every week, that it takes money to run the church and all of those things in Malachi that we say all the time. Heavenly Father God, the truth of the matter is we are in a new dynamic now. And the dynamic that we're in, we need action. And we need action for those who call on the name of Jesus and are called by his name. So I pray, God, even though what I see in front of me is a mountain, is a mountain, and I cannot see the other side. But you, God, I know are the Lord of the valley. You're the Lord of the mountain, and you are standing and waiting on the other side. So I pray, God, that you would speak, and you would speak to these people who are listening to this message, and they would move in obedience to what it is you're telling us to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. message, different tone, different everything, I think. Does he know me? You know what we think about God? I just said it when I was up here. God knows you and knows you down. So why would I ask the question, does he know me? Because the Bible tells us that he does know us, but do you know you? And do you know who you are and who you are in Christ? And are you in relationship with him? And do you hear his voice? Because do you hear his voice? Because you need to hear it to make an action. If you're not hearing God's voice telling you to move and what to do, then you're moving on your own thoughts and your own thoughts and your own actions. God wants to talk to you, and he wants to have a conversation with you. And the question is, uh, do you hear him, and does he know you, and do you know him? So I'm getting that from John chapter 3, uh, 10, verse 3, which says, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Leads them out of what? Leads them out of the mess and leads them out of, leads them whatever you need him to lead you out of. He leads you out. Why? Because you hear his voice. Everybody say his voice. His voice. voice. Do you hear his voice? And when you hear his voice, he will call you to action and to obedience. Number one. Recognition of God's voice is based on relationship and obedience. And I mean in that order. You have to have this relationship with Christ. This relationship to Christ should cause you to move towards obedience. Did you know that that's measurable? What? It got quiet. Pastor, what do you mean this measurable? Oh, it's measurable. Your relationship with God will he will tell you things and help your understanding when you have then the understanding of God you can't help but move see there's an assumption that when you became a Christian 
and you started calling Jesus by name, you took on his name, you took on his character, which means you should have some understanding of who Christ is and move like Christ did, who was totally submitted to the Father. He said, what, I see, what you see me do, I do the will of who? My Father. So when we take on the name of Christ, then we ought to do the will of Christ, and that is measurable, meaning we ought to be able to look at your life and see, are you doing the will of Christ? Are you obedient to the things that Christ is telling you to do? And that is measurable. Now, I don't sit here as a pastor and measure your work. Who does what? I could do that. I could do that. But that's not on me, that's on you. Now, we may feel the effects, we may feel the results of that. Are you teaching a Bible school? Are you a study? Are you mentoring people? Who are you sitting down and mentoring with? Uh, who's mentoring you? Who uh, are you? On and on and on and on. It's measurable. And then what is your action that you're doing? that is in line with the word of God. Two, it's your faith, not your lineage, determines your ability to hear God's voice. You see, faith is personal. Uh, doesn't matter what your daddy did, what your mother did, your sister did, what this one is doing over here. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God that way. Your faith is not going to increase necessarily that way unless they're praying for you. No, your relationship and your faith in God is personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. And he knows, he knows you, but do you know him? And if you do know him, then how does that faith work? Because you see, faith is not a corporation. You don't marry into it. Vicki, you don't marry into faith, you all. It's not necessarily in your lineage and then it comes into your DNA. No, nope, not necessarily. You have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Then you will be a saved, saved, saved. That's it. You. Mm-hmm. So it's not a national movement. It's a relational movement. You must know and hear God for yourself. Wouldn't you all say that nowadays there's a bunch of noise out there? I mean, it's always been there, but the volume's turned up. All the time. So how does God in your life penetrate through all of that mess to get into your hearing, into your knowledge, and into your understanding, and to you as a being to move? I can tell you what, the more noise, which I heard a bunch of amens and stuff about, the more noise there is, the more we need to rise up. It's not a time to be quiet. It's not. Because we have the power that lives within us to silence the noise so that the truth can split right through all of that noise into the hearts and in the minds of the people. And I cannot tell you a time in my lifetime when the greatest move of God could be happening right now. Because people who don't even know God and don't even believe God have some inkling that something crazy is happening and I wonder what it is. Is that true? They're like, what's happening? People who don't even know God are asking. They've heard a little bit. They've heard the word Armageddon. They've heard... They've heard certain things, uh, people are going to be raptured, they've heard that, and they're looking at the signs and going, oh man, what is all of this? And what, you know what God needs? He needs us to go over there and clear that noise out and go, yes. And do you know what God wants to say and what God has to do about that? Yes, because times are short. So I'm going to talk about three other things today, doubt, denial, and relationship. Everybody say doubt, denial. And relationship. 
I'm going to talk about the disciples and their relationship with Jesus and those three things. So the first question that I have for you, and I'm going to ask you three questions, and they are rhetorical questions, meaning I already know the answer before I ask you. And the answer is yes. So everybody might as well just say, yes, Lord. You might as well just say it because that's the truth. The answer is yes. So the first question is, have you ever stubborn, stubbornly doubted God? Have you ever doubted God? And the answer is yes, 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 you have. Now, how have you done it? And do you recognize that you did it? Well, let's examine that today. Amen. John, you guys know the story. 20, 24 and 25. Now, Thomas called the twin. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples before, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. I don't believe. <laughs> I don't believe. Any, anyone ever heard of Missouri? And Missouri has a nickname. You know what it is? It's the show. You know, you're from there. It's the show me state. So in other words, there are some people, there are some cultures that are not going to believe anything unless they see it for themselves. Can I say something about that? That type of thinking in the kingdom of God is absolutely 100% backwards. And a lot of people operate that way. They're not going to move until they absolutely 100% see a movement of God they don't walk by faith. They walk by what they see. Uh-huh. And that was, that was him. I mean, it wasn't enough. You guys got to get this picture. He's been hanging with the disciples over three and a half years. Jesus is dying, rose from the dead, right? And he has his buddies that he's been hanging with all these years who are saying, we saw him. And you know what he said? I don't care if you all tell me you saw him or not. I don't believe it till I see him. You know how that translates? It's like last week. We had our testimony service, right? And I testified to some things. Some other people came and testified to some things. And some other people are sitting there probably, I don't believe that. That's just too far-fetched. What? No. That's not possible for a woman who has an issue of blood like Jesus had for that to be healed nowadays. They didn't say it, but there was doubt, a little bit of doubt. And you know why? Because they want to see it for themselves. Listen, I love being in places. I love being there when God is doing miracles. But I'm not, my faith is not 100% dependent on God doing miracles. And, me, and I don't believe it that he can do it unless I see it. Nonsense. God can do it whenever he wants to do it and however he wants to do it. Do you re realize how restricting that would be on the kingdom of God if no miracle happened unless you saw it? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So we all have a little bit of doubting Thomas in us, you see, because what do we doubt about? What did I just say? I just gave a mini message about finances. That's one of the big ones where people doubt God. I don't believe in God. Give 10% that... I can make it. I can still pay rent. I can still do all the other things if I pay 10%. People don't believe that. That's one of the number one things they, they doubt God about. And God has already said, hey, I know how you all are about money, but hey, try it. And see, test me. Test me, God said, on this thing and see. And people are like, yeah, I don't believe that, God. Jobs, we doubt God about jobs, relationships, we doubt God about that or don't invite him into it. And might I say health, I can be the same way, so this is not me pointing the finger at anybody. But you know the second something goes wrong with you, do you drop down on your knees and go, hey, God, I don't know what's going on with this, but I do know that you are the healer, and I know that you hold all things in your hand. Will you take this from me, or do we get our, pick our phone and go, can I make a doctor's appointment? What's going on? Well, do you need to go to urgent care or to the emergency room? What's, what do you do first? 
Mm -hmm. Cause it's all quiet. And I'm quiet too. It's quiet there where you're sitting at the house too, isn't it? But do we doubt God on things? Do we pray for someone? Why do we have to wait till someone is on their deathbed or the medical community has said, well, there ain't nothing else we can do before we ask God to take care of it. Why don't we ask him in the very beginning? When we first hear somebody is sick over there or something's going over there, why don't we bring them before God instead of be bringing them some ibuprofen? Why don't we just go sit at the knee at their bed or go take their hand and pray for them and intercede? Why don't we stop eating and fast for them? Mm -hmm. John 20, 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas said to them, Jesus came. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to read the rest of that in just a second. So you know, and you see here, Jesus is already risen from the dead, and Jesus passes through the walls because the disciples are all locked up because they saw what happened to Jesus, and they don't want it to happen to them. So they're in there little locked up tight, and nobody can get to them, and Jesus just passes through the walls and through the doors and all of that. Here comes your faith test. I have heard probably three at the minimum and probably more than that cases lately where people are passing through walls and just passing through buildings, walls, windows, and just getting transported and teleported. I wonder, I wonder what happened. Did anybody doubt what I said just now? Are you doubting Thomas? Because if Jesus did it, he said, greater things will you do than these things I've done. So passing through a wall shouldn't be that rough since Jesus already did it. Hmm. Because why? Because the world is going crazy. The noise I talked about before, he needs somebody to believe that you can do it. <laughs> that if it needs to happen, it can happen. How about we pray for some of those people over in Afghanistan who are getting killed and all getting all jacked up and go, hey, Jesus, can you do that thing with them? And when right before they get ready to hurt them or cut them or something, can you just make them disappear, God? <laughs> There's some missionary who's in trouble. Something's happening with them and their lives in peril. Hey, God, can you help them, God? Just make them just disappear and reappear over there. That's like what you did. I didn't even be in my notes, y'all. But you all need to hear it. Because God is moving in ways that is not equal to the task, but greater than the task. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger in here and put your, and look at my hands and reach your hand in here and put it inside my side. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, oh, my Lord and my God, it's you. <laughs> Whoo, hallelujah. I didn't believe it because they told me, but I see now it's you. Mm-hmm. You know what Thomas needed? He needed the personal touch from Jesus. Personal. Do you think Jesus sassed him? Thomas, come over here. I know what you said. Come over here, Thomas. Come on, you doubting dummy. Come on. Look. Or do you think he said, come here, brother. I know you have issues with that, and there's going to be people from now until the end of time who are going to have issues with that. Come on over here. I love you, and while you're here, what do you think he did? He loved him into that. He loved him with that touch and brought it to him. Three, Jesus did work with Thomas and his faith, and he'll work with you too. He'll work with you. Wherever you are, Whatever you're thinking about God and who he is, he'll meet you right where you are. And he'll work with you with kindness and compassion and he'll move you off of that spot. Amen? Have you ever denied Christ? Everybody knows you have. You don't have to confess it. Yes, because we know you have. We all have. Matthew 26. You know Peter. Watching Jesus take that whooping he was taking. It's up on the screen, but I'm not going to read it because you know the story. And Peter denied Christ three times. And after he denied him the third time, you know that the rooster crowed. But what I'm going to read is the last one. 
It says, before the rooster crows three ti times, you would deny me uh, three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. That's really important, you see. But I do have another question for you. Have you ever had denied Christ? Because if you have, have you had the rooster ever had to crow on you? Have you heard that? Because you denied Christ? You're thinking to yourself, well, no, I don't think so. Well, how do I do it? Well, I mean, I wrote a few things out of my own life. So maybe you'll be able to identify. Uh, so when has the rooster crowed with you? Uh, God told you to pray for somebody and you didn't do it. He told you to give an offering, your tithe. Guess what? You didn't do that. Uh, denying Christ. He told you to go somewhere and do something, and you didn't do that. He said to say something to someone about something, and then you didn't do that. Or he told you not to say something to someone, and you said it anyway, because, you know, that thing goes both ways. He said to be kind to someone. He said to be patient, and we just like, we hear. You get that umption from God. Don't you know that when God tells you to do something, you don't do it? It's like denying him. Or did I miss it on that? Maybe I did. I don't know. I just wrote some of this stuff this morning. I don't think I did. We deny him. And so when we deny him, the question is, do we repent? And in this case, do we weep over that? Do we feel bad and weep over the fact like Peter did? Because when the rooster crowed, Peter wept like a baby. Because then he remembered. Do you remember? Do you remember all the things that God has done for you and when he tells you to do something and you don't do it? Do you weep over that? Or you go, ah, next time, God. I got it next time. Oh, how about this time? And if we don't do it, then just go to God. We just told you with Thomas, he's waiting for us and waiting on us to come and repent and weep over the things do I mean sit there and cry like Peter did? No. I mean repent, right? Just repent. God, okay. I know I blew it over there. And can you forgive me? And I'll try to be better next time. And the next time, be better. Amen? Man, do I have some stories for you. But because of time, I'm not going to tell you about not doing what God said. And then just being jacked up behind it. I remember I was in Bangor, Maine, and my sister and I were walking uh, by a river there doing the tourist thing, and a woman came by, and God told me, go talk to her about me, and I was like, I can't, God, I'm on vacation right now. Don't you see me? I'm up here looking at the sights and taking pictures and doing, I don't, and I didn't do it. And don't you know to this day, that was probably four or five years ago, I'm still haunted by the fact that I didn't go talk to that woman. She had a little bit of limp, so I know what God wanted. He wanted me to go over there and pray for her about that limp. And I'm like, I'm on vacation, God. I'm just being real with y'all. <laughs> I'm trying to be real, and I didn't do it. And my heart still hurts because I didn't go over there and talk to that woman. And I keep repenting for it, but God is saying to me, listen, when I tell you to pray for somebody, pray for them. Anybody here need prayer? I'll pray for you. Right, I'll stop what I'm doing right now, and I will pray for you because I don't want that on my heart anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you get that kind of pain when you don't do what God tells you to do? Does it hurt, or are you fine with it? Because if you're fine with it, you can count on God keep revisiting it with you until you're not fine with it. Well, that was kind of deep. I'm going to say that again. God shouldn't have to keep revisiting with us with stuff he told us to do, but he's going to keep revisiting it with you until you do it, until you move off of what he said. Then he'll have something else for you. We call it being stuck. <laughs> Thank you, God. Four, when our faith fails invariably, we will deny Christ and can't hear his voice. You know what? You can put that John scripture up there. Peter messed up so bad that Jesus had to go and pull him to the side and privately administer to him. You guys know that? He, his pain was so great from denying Christ 
that Christ had to pull him to the side and tell him, it's okay. It's okay, bro. I know. You, you, let's just put it this way. You did it so the scriptures had to be fulfilled. How about that? But you're still mine. I still love you. He's doing the same thing with you. He's calling you. And he's saying, I saw what you did. I know what you did. But I forgive you. I want to forgive you. It's okay. And you know what the question is? Easy. Do you love me? <laughs> That's the question he asked Peter. Hey, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus like, Peter's like, God, you, I love you. I love you. And he asked him three times, right? So he, re, he reconciled Peter back to him, but he still came back with a question. It's the same question I have for you. Do you love him? If you love him, keep his commandments. Amen. Keep his commandments. He restored him. And the last question is, do you have a real relationship with Jesus? So here's the scene. It's the grave scene, and Jesus has risen from the dead. And, you know, Peter and John and them are running there. They see he's gone, and they leave, and now their angels are there. There's a couple of angels. Here comes Mary, Mary Magdalene. You know the one that Jesus casts the devils out of. And she comes and goes, oh, man, where's Jesus? Who took him? She sees a couple of angels in there. She goes, did you all take Jesus? Where's Jesus? And then Jesus over here says, hey, and here it is. Let's pick it up that. She says, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. There's a message in that all by itself. How many times has Jesus been standing there with you? You don't even know it's Jesus. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, have you carried him away? And tell me where you have laid him. And take me, I will take him away. You know how ridiculous that is? That's just, your mind is cloudy. Anyone ever been there? You're just so sad. You're just so hurt. Stuff is messed up so badly that you just say stuff that doesn't even make any sense. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why would a gardener open it? How could a gardener move that stone to begin with? And for what reason could a gardener possibly want to take a body? Invasion of the gardener snatchers. <laughs> what? What, Mary? What? Just hurting, man, hurting, hurting, hurting. And then here it is, catch it. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned around to him and said, Rabboni, get that? That relationship. When Jesus said her name, oh, man. When Jesus says your name, oh, See, the question is, we have to ask ourselves, how many times do we, Jesus trying to tell us something and we think it's the gardener? I mean, who's the gardener in your life? That'd be a good thing to figure out. Jesus is trying to get past something and you've got gardeners in your life. Is it somebody you know? This, you're chattering in your ear that you go to? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? Is it your mom or dad? Who's the gardener in your life? And it's actually Jesus. Sometimes it might come through deja vu. Something. Hmm. Five. Heading home. Our faith and relationship with Christ are the canal to hearing his voice. Hebrews 11 and 6 says this. Somebody better get this today. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of the ones who diligently seek him. Not the ones that are just passing by and trying to grab something. You know, that drive-by relationship. You take a shot and keep on going. No, not that. Diligently. Diligently means getting with it. 
Diligently means getting the first thing I do in the morning is I'm going to spend some time with you, Jesus. Diligently means that when something is going right, something is going wrong. I got a praise on my lips for you, Jesus. Diligently means that everything that I see and am introduced to during the course of the day, I'm looking it through it through the eyes of Jesus, and I'm asking, and I'm talking to him, and I'm seeking him diligently uh, every single day. That's diligent. That's what he's doing. Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You hear the word of God, your faith goes up. You act, you do something, you hear the word of God, your faith goes up. Do you know there's no difference between me or any other person who, who believes certain things about God? And in this case, I'll just use the, the uh, healing aspect because I get asked to pray for people and healing all the time. I already told you how I feel about that. And you know why I have to do that a lot? Or I do that a lot? It's because a person who's asking me doesn't believe. That if they don't believe, they believe that God is going to hear me at a higher rate than he's going to hear them. There's something on me that's not on them. That's why they're asking me it. Are y'all following with me? Yes. They, there's nothing on me that couldn't be on you. Where's your faith? The faith, faith, the faith piece. I did preach a message about that, didn't I? How do people get healed in this case? Because that person who needs to be healed believes that Jesus can do it. That person can get healed because somebody else's faith believes that that can happen, which is what an example I just gave you. And the third way is it can happen just because God said it's time for it to happen. He just got, I just want to do this. And he does it. So which one of those three? How about we up our faith, and we're one of those who can also has enough faith to believe that God can do it. I got this from my devotional, utmost for his highest is what it's called. And it said, the goal of Christian faith is not to know something, but to do something with what you know. That's, that's it. Do something with what you know. Catherine, you can come on back up. Revelation 3.20 says this. Behold, I, Jesus, stand at the door and knock. Knock, knock, knock. I'm not going to hit my mic like I was going to. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup dine with him and he with me. God is knocking on the door of our hearts and of our minds. Today, tomorrow, and in the future. The question is, are you going to open the door? You know how we are. There's the door. You all know. Someone rings the doorbell, knocks on it. You think it's I won't say the name of the religion, but, you know, one of those groups or, you know, whatever. So instead of just going and opening the door, you know, you know how we are. Me too. Is that what we're doing to Jesus? He's knocking on the door and are we like, oh, I don't know, Jesus. Let me see. Is it really you? Jesus can speak from behind that door. He goes, it's me. I'm knocking on the door. Do you hear me? Do you hear my voice? Do you know who I am? Open the door and let me in and I will come. You know what it means to sup with someone? What kind of relationship do you have to have with someone to invite them in and say, come on, let's sit down and eat? That's a different level than just come on in and have a cup of coffee. No, come on in and let us, let's eat. That's a different relationship. Do you want that relationship today? Let's pray. The altar is open. If you want to come up, come on up. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we want to hear your voice, and we want to hear your voice today. God, I know that someone out there, they don't know what it means to hear your voice. They want to hear your voice, but they just don't know what that means. Someone out there thinks they hear your voice, 
And we all struggle with that, God. So I ask, Lord, that you would speak clearly. Speak clearly to us, God. That we would know that it's you. And God, after you speak with us, Lord, we have to move in obedience. The Bible tells us that we can't just be hearers of the word, but we have to be doers of the word. There has to be an action. After we've heard the word of God, and I pray, God, that we would be also doers of the word. And we pray, Heavenly Father God, on this day, that today is changing day. Any day that we want to change, we can change. We just need to take one little step. And I pray that we do that today. Great defender, so much better you guys stand with us it's your breath in high lungs so we pour out our praise for I it's your breath in our lungs so come on now come on now this is gonna be it for a week come on now it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out, pour in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. One more time, it's our breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. So, Heavenly Father God, we pray over those who are in this building, Heavenly Father God. We pray your anointing and the real Holy Spirit to drop on them right here, right now. Someone who's been sad, drop on them right now. Someone who's been lonely, drop on them right now, Heavenly Father. With your Holy Spirit and your fire, God, put it in them right now that they will go out and tell somebody about Jesus and invite them into the church to hear the word of God. The world is hungry, 
and I pray for the ones who are online that your Holy Spirit would drop on them right where they're sitting. They're sitting there in their pajamas, Heavenly Father God, but your Spirit is there. They're sitting there having a cup of coffee and sitting and talking to their family, but your Spirit is there, God, and I pray you drop on them in the name of Jesus. Let this week be a real week of movement and evangelism in the name of Jesus. We pray, and we pray your blessing over them. Lord, we pray for those who are in um, victims of the earthquake in Haiti. We pray for firefighters, Heavenly Father, battling fires. We pray for those who are in flooding situations, Heavenly Father, God. We pray for those who are in Afghanistan. We pray for, over our troops, God. There's nothing that's too big for you uh, to handle. So, Lord, we give all of that to you in the name of Jesus. Have your way. And let the church say. If you gave your life to Christ today, that was one of the best decisions you've ever made. We would like to reach out to you and help you in this walk. Please text SAVED to 833-535-0980. And we believe that one of the most important things you can do is to stay connected to Christian brothers and sisters. So please text CMC Connect at 833-535-0980 and we will reach out to you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a blessed week. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Oh, they never fail us. They've never failed us and they won't start now. You've never failed us. You have never failed us. You won't forsake us. You were the word at the beginning. The one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory. Sweet and